So moving on to the second point. So I think in general, and I, and I, I, I you know, I, I still give norm reference tests. I still interpret them. I still do comprehensive assessments. Um, I still have to check myself with this on the accuracy of norm reference tests. When we get that number, it's, you know, I, I, I like statistics kind of makes me feel warm and fuzzy, right? That we get this number and we have a quantified way of getting performance. I like it, you know, myself and my, looking at my own performance uh, with my kids when I, you know, see their performance on some sort of test, you know, we it's, it's nice to be able to quantify performance, but we need to think about what is the level of accuracy that we're getting? And the, the, the spoiler alert here is that oftentimes these tests are not as accurate as we often think, right? So often these tests are not as accurate as we think. And we're going to go through talking about why that may be. All right. I'm going to do a psychometrics crash course. If, you, if I lose you on some of this, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, the, a lot of this should be review for you. Um, I don't think I'm going to lose you because you've heard these terms before and we're just going to keep it simple. So one thing we often think about with, with testing is this term reliability, right? And so when a, a, a test is reliable, we're saying that those data, they're stable and repeatable, right? So if I gave a test on Monday, am I getting similar performance as to, as you know, if I gave it on Friday, um, and our norm reference tests are set up really well for this. Uh, you know, our, our norm reference tests, uh, they're designed to give reliable and stable data by having everyone get the same instructions, everyone get uh, the same probes and the same pictures. Uh, and there's different ways that we can document this. We can do test retest reliability. We can also do what they call split half reliability. So you know, if we have 100 items, do we see that performance on the odd items is roughly equivalent to performance on the even items? Um, and like I said, in general, a lot of our norm reference tests, this is a relative strength. Validity. So is this test measuring what you think you are measuring, right? Mm -hmm. So when you give the self the comprehensive evaluation of language fundamentals, so that's a common norm reference test. When you give that test, are you getting similar performance on a narrative, for example? So that we would see this, the children who score high on the self tell a really good narrative and the students who score low on a self tell a relatively uh, weak narrative, right? Uh, do we see you know, your performance on the tackle is related to your listening in the classroom? Um, and so, you know, that's ideally what we would see with our tests a little bit later. I'll talk about how that's not always the case, but hopefully the validity and reliability point makes sense. I think this graphic is really helpful for seeing, for, for understanding reliability and validity. So, uh, you know, reliability, this would be, you're, you're getting very repeatable data. So these two are showing reliable data. You're getting uh, something that's very repeatable and consistent. One of these is valid if we assume the middle of the bullseye is what we're going for. And one of these is not valid, right? And you see here, you know, this one, if you averaged all of these together, you'd be getting valid data, but it's not very reliable. It's not very consistent. It's not very repeatable, okay? So reliability and validity. What I'm going to talk a little bit more about today, because I think this is really important for us to think about, is this concept of diagnostic accuracy. And these terms that I'm going to use, they're, they're really uh, uh, not the best terms. But you know, do the data that we get, do they result in an accurate diagnosis? OK. So one thing we look at is called the sensitivity. You know, this is why it's great to have Google. If you want to, you know, if you forget what sensitivity is, you can look it up. Um, but sensitivity, this is, you know, are we getting, are we accurately able to diagnose students who have impairments? Specificity is the other way. This is true negatives. Are we able to accurately diagnose people who, or accurately not diagnose people who do not have impairments? I'm sorry, that should say. Uh, accurately not diagnose people, who, uh, individuals who do not have an impairment. All right. So uh, if we have some 
magic way of knowing that a child has a diagnosis or does not have a diagnosis. We hope that our tests are consistent with that, right? So if you fail a test, we hope that that child actually has the diagnosis. If they pass the tests, we hope that the child does not have a diagnosis, okay? So this is what we're really going for and what we're looking for in our tests. And when people do studies of tests and uh, uh, analyses of the accuracy of the tests, this is often one of the one of the key things that they are looking for. And you can also get it wrong, right? You can get false positives and false negatives. So you can fail a test and uh, you know the child might not have a diagnosis or you can pass the test and the child actually does have a diagnosis, okay? So what we're really shooting for is this one here. When we give that test, hopefully if they fail the test, they have a diagnosis. If they don't fail the test, if they pass it, they do not have the diagnosis. Now, one of the things we need to do when we're looking at sensitivity and specificity is decide what's the score that we're using, the cutoff score, the cut point, whatever you want to call it, right? So we pick some sort of score. So for simplicity, I'll say one and a half standard deviations below the mean. So if you perform above that score, you'd be considered to be typically developing. Um, if you perform below that score, you'd be considered to have an impairment or a disorder. Historically, the cutoff score that was used in Wisconsin was 1.75 standard deviations below the mean. Now, one thing that I'm sure many of you noticed in this revised guidance is that that number 1.75 is no longer in the rule. All right, that 1.75 is no longer in the rule. And the reason why is there's some old research and relatively newer research showing that these cut scores are not as precise and accurate as we are led to believe, okay? So this is a classic study. Plant and Vance, 94. Uh, they looked at 20 children with uh, uh, developmental language disorder, specific language impairment, language disorder, whatever you wanna call it, but ch 20 children with language disorders and 20 children with normal language. And they uh, administ administered four different tests that had decent published psychometrics. And then what they did is they threw the results into the computer and they said, at what point do we do the best job of identifying kids with and without disorders? At what point do we find the best sensitivity and specificity? And rather than me continuing to talk about this, I think it's best for me to show you what these results were, all right? So they had these four different tests. So the Clark Madison, the Tackle, the Teld, and the Spelt. And, um, the sensitivity, so identifying kids who had true disorders, was anywhere from 63% to 90%. Uh, so uh, some of these were relatively strong. The spelt was relatively strong. Some of these weren't as good. The Clark Madison and the Tackle weren't as good. And then we look at the specificity, and we see that, um, uh, you know, the, the overall a, a bit better with the specificity. So, you know, the kids who didn't have disorders scored higher. Uh, so one thing to note with this is that these scores are not that unusual. These are pretty good. Uh, you know, 60% is a little bit low, 90% is fantastic, but I've spent a lot of time looking at sensitivity and specificity uh, over the years and, you know, 70, 80% is pretty average. And that's pretty good. You know, you're getting it right most of the time. And this result here may kind of shock you a bit that they're getting it wrong 20, 10, 20, 30%, almost 40% of the time. Okay. So that's coming to the central point that they're the central uh, hypothesis of this section that the tests aren't always as accurate as, accurate as we believe. Then the other thing that was, you know, made my jaw hit the floor when I first read this was looking at the variability in cutoff scores, right? So on some of these tests, we see that uh, the cutoff score was really low. So what this means so for the Clark Madison, if you scored below 2.74 standard deviations below the mean, uh, 
then you had a disorder. If you scored above it, you did not have disorder. So if you scored one, 1.5, 1.75, 2, 2.5 below the mean, you were considered to not have a disability based on this analysis. And we contrast that with the tackle and the teld, where those cutoff scores were much higher, right? So here, if you just scored half a standard deviation or you know, three quarters of a standard deviation below the mean, you would be considered to have a disability. If you scored above that, you did not have a disability. All right, hopefully I didn't lose you with this. Hopefully you're thinking, wow, that's amazing. If not, I'll give a practical example that we all have had. I remember uh, a long time ago, uh, we had triplets uh, come into uh, the clinic where I worked and uh, we did a very bad practice. We did three different separate evaluations, didn't confer on what we were gonna use. Uh, the other two gave the PLS, I gave the self preschool. The other two SLPs found no disorder, I found a disorder. Now, when we got together and talked, we realized they were all at the same language level, but the self preschool scored lower in general than the PLS, right? And that's, I'm not the only one who's ever noticed that or identified that, but we can see different results across different tests, okay? Hopefully that's fairly clear. Hopefully you're with me. Now, one thing to consider with this particular uh, example is that this is a pretty old study. It's from 96, right? This is back during the old Mars Cheese Castle years. Okay. And Andrea, when I showed her this, she said, what's the Mars Cheese Castle? But anyone in the uh, southeastern Milwaukee corridor who's gone between Milwaukee and Chicago knows the Mars Cheese uh, Castle. So this was a pretty old study. They used kind of some fringish type tests and tests have gotten better over the years. So I'm going to show you some newer data, right? So this is uh, from 2006, you know, the, 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 when we almost had the, the new Mars cheese castle. So this was uh, still Elena Plant and her group uh, looking at a bunch of different tests and looking at the sensitivity and specificity. And what we see here, so they, they have all of these different tests that were given and we see all of the sensitivity and specificity. I circled some of these that are relatively strong. I mean, these are actually really strong. We're at 90% getting close to 100% sensitivity and specificity. It looks fantastic. But then we also look at some of these and it's not as encouraging. And some of them are getting closer to the point of, uh, you know, kind of flipping a coin. Your results, you're basically flipping a coin to see if someone has a disorder or not. And my other main point that I was trying to hammer, on, hammer home here is look at the variation and cutoff scores that were used. Look at this variability. So when test developers are getting their sensitivity and specificity, what they're doing is they are optimizing, in general, they're optimizing the cutoff score that they use to get the best sensitivity and specificity, all right? So you can see, I think the, the self is a great example. The self P, if we use a relatively traditional cutoff score, I mean, a, more of a clinical or research one than a, a, a school-based cutoff score of 85, we get really crummy results. You only get it, you get it right a third of the time or a little bit less. However, if we kind of stack the deck for ourselves and say, ah, let's use 96 as our cutoff score, you get relatively good, strong sensitivity and specificity, okay? So what's my point here? My point is, you know, I have a couple points. One, these tests aren't giving as accurate of information as we often think. Those numbers that we get, they aren't as precise as we often think. Also, depending on who you're testing and the characteristics of the, the student and the characteristics of the sample, the performance is gonna vary widely. And, and you can even see variance across different tests, right? Um, so we need to use some caution. One other, you know, I'm gonna do one more little psychometric thing here. I just want you to think about this as well. Also, when we're looking at these tests and when you're looking at the psychometrics of these tests, oftentimes uh, we need to think about what's called the gold standard. So basically, what we're talking about with the gold standard is what are we comparing it to, right? So we have some sort of experimental measure. Uh, 
when I say experimental, you know, this is the PLS or the self or whatever, whatever we're trying to validate. And we, what we typically do is say, all right, let's look at the PLS and how does that relate to the self preschool? So, you know, th that would be the validity is how do these two relate to each other? Or if we are developing the self five, what we'll often do is correlate that with the self four. Or if we're doing that diagnostic accuracy, the sensitivity and specificity, what we'll typically do, what they'll typically do is say, all right, how does this test do at saying whether or not you have a disorder? And we'll compare that performance to how you did on some other norm reference test. What they are not typically doing, what they're not typically doing is saying, all right, how are you doing on the self for some norm reference test? And how does that relate to functional language skills? That is typically not done. How are you doing on this new version of the test and how does that correlate with your ability to communicate? That is a beautiful, oops, sorry, beautiful way of looking at validity, but it's not commonly done. Uh, you know, does this norm reference test say you have a disorder or not? And how does that result compare to a comprehensive assessment? That would be ideal, but in our test manuals, that's not typically done. Okay, so I just want to give you a quick example. Uh, I went through, I, this is, I happen to have this, uh, this manual at home. I went through the TOLD P4 manual uh, and they had relatively good sensitivity and specificity. I mean, you know, 0 0.74, 0 0.87, you're getting it right 75 to 87% of the time. Now, they got those numbers based on whether or not you scored above or below 90. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't consider many students or children who score an 89 or an 88 or an 87 to have a disorder. Um, John, John. Yes. So yes. there is a question I think related that you could address right now. And yes. it's a, can you explain how a score above the mean could be the cutoff for that, for a test? Absolutely. There was a fascinating paper by Heilman, Ellis Weisberg, <laughs> yada, 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 yada looking at the sensitivity and the specificity of the PLS for a group of late talkers in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, our goal, our, our cut point was 104. Now that one was kind of funny because, you know, we weren't really saying a language disorder, but the kids who were in that sample tended to be upper middle class kids from Madison, right? So, everything scored a little bit higher, everything trended higher. So average for that group was probably a score of about 110 to 115. So kids who scored, I think my test, I think the, the, the criteria was low hundreds, like 104 or something. If you scored below 104, we considered you to have a disorder. If you scored above it, we didn't. Consider it the lake will be gone effect. Gosh, that is such an old and probably canceled uh, type of statement. So I apologize for that. Uh, but it was where all the children are above average. Um, so what we can see, what, what you'll see, and, and what you're probably seeing with um, these results here, where you get something like above, uh, uh, above a um, 95 on the spelt is probably... The, whatever sample they used to test that, they were probably a higher performing group of kids. These were kids who probably knew how to take a norm reference test. Everyone scored a little bit higher. So we got to make it more rigorous in order to see the strong kids versus the weak kids. I don't want to spend too much time on this because uh, if, yeah, because I think it's, I don't want to lose the big point, but hopefully that makes some sense. Great question. Um, okay, so getting back to my told example, uh, and, and you know, where they got the sensitivity and specificity is whether or not you scored high versus low on the PLOS, which I have never given or seen, the pragmatic language outcome scale. My guess is that they probably gave a bunch of tests and they got a really good result with this one, so they included it in the test manual, okay? That's another thing to remember with the, the so another thing that I think is going on with that table that we saw is a lot of the results in there were from test manuals and those were the ones that made sense. 
Other ones were from peer-reviewed studies not affiliated with the test developer, and those were the ones that were a little more weird. And they probably got a convenient sample where everyone scored a little bit higher. I, I don't think that test developers uh, um, purposefully, you know, give, I, I don't think that they give invalid data. I don't think they give inaccurate data, but I certainly think that they're interested, they, they have a vested interest in showing the best data that they can. Okay, so why do we see differences across these tests? This is gonna get back to that question as well. Why do we see differences across these tests? Well, we can see differences in the norming sample, right? So when you see certain differences in race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, language spoken, dialect spoken, do they include children with disabilities or not? Just the luck of the draw, you know, that's gonna make a, a group of kids that they norm a test on relatively high, relatively low, you know, it's gonna vary across tests. Um, and what we notice is that when we're making these comparisons, if we have students from uh, culture, culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, uh, the, the normative samples tend to include fewer of those students. So when we compare those students to a group where they're not represented, we're gonna see uh, generally a different pattern of performance. I know that was a lot of vagueness in there, but I can clarify here in the coming, uh, uh, the coming slides. Why is performance different for some students, right? So we have our biases in our tests. If you're not familiar with the test, you're likely to perform worse. If you get punished for a dialect or your experience, you're gonna score worse because the students that these tests were normed on for the most part, you know, they have experience with the task. They know how to do the test. They're not penal, uh, kind of quote, penalized for these different, uh, uh, these, these different aspects. So um, the, the, the student who does not meet those characteristics is gonna uh, look like they score worse than they, they actually do. All right, so what are we supposed to do? What's one to do? I think one thing is to learn about your tests, learn about the reliability, learn about the validity and sensitivity and specificity. Uh, our tests, they typically put the representation of the normative sample as your student represented in that group. Does the test account for culture, language, and dialect? So we should know our test. As I say to my students, when you go to the, the, the you know, your test manual, you have the half of it that has all the uh, dog tagged ears and it's all you know open. And then you have the other half that's you know, kind of not ever been creaked open. But we should look in there. We should see what a test is designed for, what a test, uh, you know, what the reliability and validity is. Just before uh, today, for example, I went down to our, our test closet and pulled out the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Manual. And I looked through it and I read it. And I, what I was looking for is, was this test designed to identify students with language disorders? Uh, and in fact, it was not. Uh, what type of uh, information does it have about its diagnostic accuracy? It has no information about diagnostic accuracy. It was. I know the Peabody pretty well, but even reading through it again, it was informative for me to see why was this test developed? What's its intended use? What can it tell you about children with suspected language disorders? And when I looked through it, I thought it, it confirmed that, yeah, this probably isn't the best test to use to try to identify a language disorder. Also, you know, within our evidence-based practice framework, we need to use our clinical experience, use our clinical expertise. If you know something about a certain test, you probably are accurate, right? So my clinical intuition about the PLS, uh, or at least the older versions of the PLS, uh, was confirmed when I talked to other clinicians. And then when I started my PhD and read some articles, it confirmed that uh, a little bit further. We can look for data to support this. So there, we may find some information in research articles that will help us understand this. Uh, but you know, our clinical intuition um, uh, can be powerful as well. So understanding the, the, the norms of, or the limitations of these norm reference tests in general, our modern tests 
generally have good reported psychometrics, right? So generally have good reliability and validity, report decent sensitivity and specificity. That being said, typically much worse for students from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. But hopefully the thing that I've hammered home with this and the thing that you recognize is that we cannot rely on this one piece of data. This one piece of data alone uh, can be informative, but uh, not as accurate as we often think. And we need to corroborate with some other data that we have available. So I just wanted to introduce and show um, uh, you know, another form that we have here uh, through that's, that's available through the guidance. And I really like uh, this because you might be saying, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, we can think about things as far as the level of impact. Does it have no apparent impact, minimal, moderate, substantial, right? And as we're interpreting these scores, we can think about this within this comprehensive framework, right? So if we, you know, get in that, uh, you know, area where we think we have accurate data and we have relatively good scores and we see other data that corroborates a minimal impact, then, we know that if we have data that corroborates more of a moderate impact, we can do that. And again, looking beyond this one piece of data and looking to see how is that consistent with or differ from all of these other sources of data. So, you know, scenario one, I have a test that seemed appropriate for my student. I administered a test that I know has good uh, properties. It was designed for diagnosing something like a, a language disorder. Um, the student scored, you know, let's just say, throw this out there, about one and a half standard deviations below the mean. Everything I've said before, I'd be fairly confident in, in that data, though, you know, kind of not completely sure, because I'd want to, I'd, I'd want to see how does that stand up with this other data that I collect. And most important, I shouldn't say most importantly, all equally as important, what other data can I get to show the nature of that disorder, document the educational impact and develop my IEP goals? Another scenario, maybe the student didn't quite get the norm reference test. Maybe once it started getting hard, they just stopped helping. And I can think back, oh yeah, John talked about that frustration tolerance thing. Uh, and maybe, you know, he just didn't quite you know, he wasn't engaged and didn't quite get the test. Maybe he's new to school and this is just kind of a weird thing for him. And I get that standard score, but I take a language sample, I get a teacher report, I look at the academic review and that's not as congruent, right? That's um, uh, showing a higher level of performance, showing that things are relatively mild. In this particular case, I may not sweat the, the standard score and realize that those data weren't accurate and that's okay, right? I I'm, have the ability to not just rely on that standard score. If everything else is showing no or no impact or minimal impact, I can be confident in that comprehensive assessment data and possibly not give a, uh, not have a student be eligible for services. 